Okay, Dennis. Yeah, guys, are we ready? Can, I, can I start? Yeah. Okay, so first I would really like to give a big hand to Robert because Robert is the person who has like amazing ideas, like thousands a day, and he just implies, uh, he, like implements them, like this, and I would really like to thank you for that. So, applause for him. Amazing. Amazing. So now, keep on going. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so. Um, I see many friends, I'm really happy to see you all here, and some people who don't know me, so I'm Dennis. Um, I will just start directly, so um, I hope I don't use too much of your time, but I hope it will be interesting. Um, yeah, um, let me tell you a story. Um, does, it, does it work? Yeah, let me tell you a story. So imagine, <laughs> imagine a man like who, who lived a thousand years ago, and is still alive, and he experienced all the changes in the, in the environment around him, in the cities where he lived. So imagine that probably a thousand years ago he was living in something like this. So maybe he was living here, and um, most people back then were living like this. So like little communities, like this. And there were many of those little communities everywhere. Like this. So. I, will, I really like to draw like uh, circles and lines and everything. So very important here is that there was no real planning back then. People were building their houses based on their needs and um, everything was really close by. So the people had everything in a very short distance. They were walking hardly more than 10 kilometers a day. And uh, they were basically doing agriculture. And let's assume that this man with his family and his kids, he was also building some kind of furniture. So sometimes he was maybe... So giving something to other people and getting some goods for that or in exchange or something. So let's keep that in mind. And um, very important, the life back then was taking place on the streets. So people were meeting on the streets and animals walking around and kids were playing there. So very important. Um, but also back then, I mean, a little bit later, there, there was kind of some kind of planning going on. So some people had ideas about new, new communities. Let's say a little bit bigger communities. So a bigger circle. This is actually a little village in the Netherlands, in Bourtange, which is in Honingen. So you can see that it was built to protect the people from enemies and was a little bit bigger, but still everything was really, really, on a really short distance within the little community. And um, also there, people were not walking, walking much. They were not going out of the city much. Um, and let's assume that this guy, this man, he was actually, because there were some more people living, he would actually have a job as being a, a carpenter building some furniture, selling it to others. And um, his kids were still playing around. They had a school there. Every, every little village had a school. They had, didn't have to walk much. And then his wife, doing the housework, taking care of the kids, she had everything close by, like the butcher and, and, um, or, or little shops. Every, like, yeah, there were no shops, but something like that, you know? <laughs> so just sometimes those people had to go to cities. This is the typical medieval city that you can find in Europe and in uh, everywhere in Europe, in France, Germany, Netherlands. So, as you can see here, it was also built for the people. It was with a wall to protect them. Everything was really close by. You had uh, the church in the middle, and you had a mix of functions. So, working, living, and uh, doing your daily things like shopping and everything was within the city, within walking distance. And um, very important also here, still, the streets were the meeting point. That, that was the place where people were meeting. So let's assume that there were some bigger cities here. People were going there maybe because they, they wanted to buy some spices, some stuff which is not available in the little villages, and they, they didn't go there often. It was like 30 or 40 kilometers they needed one day for that. So, um, but those cities still exist, or like little towns in the medieval times. But then there was a big change coming. This was the steam engine. And uh, now it was uh, suddenly possible to produce large amount of things for a much cheaper price, for example, furniture. And um, suddenly what happened was that outside of the cities there were factories built where furniture or other stuff could be produced very cheap. And a very big other impact, like a very big new thing was the, the train which was coming. So probably before you had some little path between, but now you had a railway line going to the cities. And because those factories were producing much more and much cheaper, that guy lost his job because he couldn't sell his furniture anymore. So actually he was then working in the factory and had to take the train every day. 
every day back and forth to work in the factory. So it was a long way actually and suddenly people moved much more. But it became actually really uh, annoying like moving every day from the village to the city so people moved to the cities. He took his whole family and moved to the, to the city and the uh, city started growing. They actually exploded. Uh, so you had the first big uh, enlargement of the cities in the 19th century. Um, you can see that in every European city. I will have an example later from Utrecht. And uh, so people were living here. And how did those cities look like? They were sustainable cities. Um, the bicycle was just invented and also the car, they were kind of the, maybe I think the bicycle was a little bit earlier. Doesn't matter, people were using the bikes, going around in cities. This is a typical picture from the 19th, like 1900. Uh, people were walking, there were a few cars, but people were not using them too much because they were very expensive and only few people could afford it. And they were actually dangerous. People were afraid of them because they were killing people. So mostly people were using bikes, going around in the streets and um, it was nice. Life was still on the streets. People were meeting there and it was still safe. I mean, people could accept those few things which were happening, but still it was just safe. You could, you could have your kids around, no problem. Um, and actually, the bicycle was very important. It was like a symbol of empowerment. So actually what you saw that in, in many of those um, advertisements for bikes, there were ladies very well dressed and very nice looking on those bikes. Because now also for ladies, it was possible to do some distances and walk around in the cities and everything, having part in the life. Very interesting. Um, and also very interesting is that every city got its tram. This is a tram, this is a picture from Witte Frauenstadt in Utrecht. So also Utrecht had its own tram. Every city in Europe and in the States had its own tram. Um, so it was a very good mean of mass transportation. It was clean, there was no pollution in the, in the city. Um, although, I mean, I'm, I'm telling this beautiful city story, of course those factories were polluting a lot and the air was probably not so good, but, but still the life in the city was good and the life was taking place on the streets. Um, this typical layout of the street back then, this is from a children's series, I took this picture. Um, you had a mix of functions. You had a lot of space for pedestrians, the tram, little space for cars, bicycles, and the trees, everything. Everything was very livable. It was very nice. It was built for the people. Um, and then there was a change coming because people were actually um, getting richer because they were working in the factories. And then suddenly they, it was possible for them to afford a car and also mass production was making cars cheaper. So this was typical advertisement back then in the 1920s. Um, Take, in, take, take your whole family and go outside, you, you have a car, you can go wherever you want, whenever you want. So that's amazing, that was a big change compared to like before. Um, and this is what I call the greatest paradigm shift in the history of urban planning, because what then happened was, it was from urban design to urban engineering. So cities were not anymore planned for people, but planned for cars. This is a big, big change. So what happened was that Cars need a lot of space, huge amounts of space. If you, you, need, you need to park your car, and if like a car needs to be parked at your work, needs to be parked at your home, you need to have guests, you need to have place at the shopping malls everywhere. You, you, you need, every car needs five times the space for parking, and then multiply it to all the cars which are there. It was no space anymore for the trams, so cars were, were moving there. You see there's less streets, uh, less trees. Um, Cities became not, not livable anymore, and then what, it was backed up by the industry. So the auto industry, people from the States know it, and the, the oil industry, they, which is, they did what they call the General Motors streetcar, the streetcar conspiracy, which was that General Motors actually bought all the, the tram networks in the USA uh, from 1930, I think, 19, until 1950, took out all the railway lines like from the, from the trams, and put all the trams away to have more place for the cars so that they can sell more of those products. And actually, the same happened in Europe. Every, every, almost every tram network in Utrecht, for example, was removed because uh, we needed space for the cars. And only few cities kept their, their tram networks. We have few cities in Europe which kept them. Um, and this, this was how the cities were looking then because of this change. People, like the planners were not planning anymore for the people. They were planning for the cars. They were planning to give more space to the car. So there was really little space for the people at the sides and no space for bicycles anymore. There was only place for cars. And a big, big change as well is that you can see here, there's a big supermarket. Those supermarkets were not existing anymore. And the other picture that I showed, there was a little cinema, there were little shops. 
and this is a big problem now for the rural areas that we have. I, I will just show you, like, because back then you had shops in every little village, pharmacies, doctors, they were all here. But then suddenly, because everybody could afford a car, um, some people thought maybe, maybe I could just build a bigger supermarket here in the next bigger village. And because it's bigger, I can buy large amounts of, of stuff and it's, I can sell it cheaper. So actually, it was not thought, like everybody took the car then to the, uh, to the supermarket here because it was cheaper. And then, of course, the supermarkets and the pharmacies and all the stuff from the little villages disappeared. So now we have the big problem, and also in terms of um, demographic change, that in the rural areas we have in the villages almost nothing anymore. And the reason for that is that people own a car. They can go wherever they want, whenever they want. Mm -hmm. This is a big problem now, and people are thinking now to find solutions for that. It's still very difficult, but let me come back to that times in the 60s, 70s. So this is a very impressive picture from the United States, but it's a typical picture. And you would think maybe now this doesn't apply for the Netherlands. It does. I will show you later. Um, so what happened was actually because people were living in those cities which were not really livable anymore, they wanted to live outside. Streets were not, not safe anymore. They were dangerous. That was the time when playgrounds were invented. So playgrounds is, is, a, is, a, is a thing from base from to react on the cars because you have a fence around it. Kids can play there because they can't play anymore on the streets. You can actually not have a cat anymore and let it, let it go around because you're afraid that it gets hit by a car. So people were moving outside of the cities and the division of functions happened. So people were only living outside anymore, uh, only living outside and working in the cities or maybe outside of the cities. So what happened was that the cities grew incredibly. And actually they, they moved together almost. Um, and of course those places have to be connected and also then industrial areas they have maybe here. So everything was disconnected and you had big malls outside, maybe one mall here and all the other houses here. So there was no mix anymore of the functions. So everybody had to go large distances to the, to the, to the place where they need to go anymore. And you can only do that with a car. Um, and the governments were supporting this. So the governments, were, and they still do, they pay you if you go to work, they pay you for your gasoline, and they also pay you to build your house outside of the cities. They give you funding. So this really backs this trend up. Big problem. So this was actually also the advertisement that is still used by the auto industry. If you want to have a car, or if, you, if you have a car, you're free. You can go wherever you want, whenever you want. But actually, this is not true. If you have a car, you're dependent on the car. You need it. If, if you don't have it, you can't live there anymore where you live, actually. Um, and this is what we get out of that. This is a picture from LA, like the car city. And um, what you can see is that there was huge infrastructure built, like, because everything here had, had to be connected. People were living here and had to go work here. So a big highway here and big highway here, of course. And then the industrial area also had to be connected with big highways everywhere. Um, and this is a big problem right now because we have rising public debt in the, in the cities. But we have to maintain all this infrastructure. And you can see it in the States and even in Europe that we can't do it anymore. But we are still building more and more to facilitate this. So this is a big problem. And you would still think again, this is, this is LA. This is not Europe. In Europe, it's, it's the same, but on a, smaller on, on a smaller scale. And if you look at China or, or Brazil or other countries, this is what happens. So this is what they're building still. Um, and this was the, the mindset back then in the 70s. So Salvador Dali said, any man of 40 who still writes the metal is a loser. Or Margaret Thatcher, a man who beyond the, beyond the age of 26 finds himself on the bus and count himself as a failure. That was really the mindset, and it still is for 90% of the people, I'm 100% sure. <laughs> so just to show you now like a short clip, um, I don't know if I can start it with this. This, is, this. this shows you what happened actually. This is LA. This shows the urban sprawl, how it happened. So LA was really, really little. And then the first car boom came in the 20s. It grew significantly. Then there was not so much going on. The war was growing. Of course, more people were moving into the city. But then you have to look what, what, what happens in the, in the 60s and 70s and in the 80s. So this is the car boom everybody had. Everybody could move wherever they want. So this is a big impact. We use a lot of space. Big problem. And we need a lot of energy to go everywhere where we want. So where are we now? Where are we today, actually? Mm -hmm. Today, 
we have built a system which kills 1.2 million, 1 million people a year just because of cars. And this, was, this is a bicycle. You know? um, what is this? This is 12 fully loaded jumbo jets crashing every day with no, with no survivors. And nobody talks about it. This is 90 people hit by a car per minute, 90 beats per minute. So streets are dangerous. We don't want any more our kids and our animals to be on the streets because now they're dangerous. This is also very interesting. The average American household spends $16,700 a year keeping the one point NAS running that it owns on average, not counting in parking and tickets, more than it spends on food and healthcare combined. And also, Germans spend on average 300,000 euros a year uh, uh, in, in their life on cars. The German railway network shrank from 58,000 kilometers in 1912 to 33,000 in 2012. So actually in 1912 you had a train station in every little village. It was possible to go everywhere by train. No problem. Oh, sorry. Um, still the trend is going on. In the EU, from 2001 to 2011, the EU railway network shrank by 2%, whereas the highway network grew by 27%. So we are still facilitating. facilitating. Very interesting. A car stands 23 hours a day without being used, and only 1.2 people sit in a car on average. So it's a very inefficient way of getting around. It's a waste of energy. It's a waste of resources. Um, that what happens. In the last 50 years, we changed our environment in order to facilitate individual motorized transport. And this is now a big problem, because the predictions for cheap energy, they are not really good, right? So we became car dependent. I mean. How many people you know living in the rural areas and said, I, I live here, but I can't live here without a car. I can't. I can't go anywhere anymore. And this is not because public transport is bad. This is because they have a car, of course. So people saying now the electric car is the, the solution to that. But tell me, which problems that I just told you will the electric car solve? No problem. Not at all. The only problem that the electric car can solve is that you have a better air quality in cities. Nothing else. So let's have a look at the Dutchies, the Netherlands. How many people do we have here from the Netherlands? OK, only a few people. But <laughs> I try to, to, to focus also a little bit on the Netherlands. So why it's different here? Why it's different? Why, why are so many people cycling here? This is because your parents, they were demonstrating in the 70s that they get their space back for their bikes. So they had demonstrations, and they, they, painted, they painted bikes on the, on the car spaces because you can, they said, this is our space. We want it. It's not only for the cars. And why did they do that? Because more than 3,000 people died in 1970 just because of cars in the Netherlands. In Germany, it was 19,000 people in 1970. 19,000. And what they did was they did this big demonstration laying on the floor, pretending that they were dead. And um, it actually helped, because they were claiming we want safe bicycle and walking infrastructure. And what did they get? They got yeah. safe bicycle and walking infrastructure. And now you have one of the safest street networks worldwide with 750 deaths in a year in 2005, which is still two people die every, year, every day because of cars. But it's comparably less to other countries. You have the world cycling capitals, which is Amsterdam, Utrecht, and Forningen. And it's amazing to live in those cities. I really love to live here and cycle here. It's amazing. It's an experience. And, and when, I, when I go the way from the city to the Oithof, and I take uh, the way from Wilhelmina Park, I see this Fietstraat. And if you, if you go through Utrecht, you can see that in the last, from last year to now, they are building Fietstraats everywhere, which means that you convert a street into a Fietstraat. That means that you can... The bicycles are leading, so they are, they are saying, or oh, the cars have to follow the bicycles and have to adapt to their speed. That's actually what it means. And uh, cyclists can go on, like, together, like four or five people in a lane, it doesn't matter. They have the right to give the lead. And the cars have to adapt, and this is, this is the way to, this is like the perfect measure. The perfect mix, slow, slower down the traffic, it will be much safer and much more livable. So every day I'm cycling this street, I'm just amazed. Um, but still, there's a problem here in the Netherlands. And what is the problem, actually? The problem is that every Dutch person a day does 35 kilometers, like, trips. This is a lot. 35 kilometers. And they don't do that on bikes. They do that 55% as a driver in a car and 20% 20, 20 sitting next to the driver in a car. So actually, 
the Dutchies also love their cars. And what you can see is that with the Feeds, they only do 7.5% of the trips because Dutch people tend to do short trips by bike, but not long trips, and that's no problem. I, I, don't, I don't ask anybody to do 30 kilometers a day by, by bike. <laughs> but of course, they could use other modes of transport. So what you have now is that Dutch people per year, per person, do 13,000 kilometers of trips, which is a lot. And this is typical. This is in every, every European country like that, and in, in the States like that. And this is without the airplane. If you count the airplane in, then it's easily 20,000 kilometers a year. And in, in the Netherlands, you have 40, 472 cars per 1,000 inhabitants, which is only 50 cars less than in the car country Germany. So you have actually, if you count, like, if you don't count all the, all the, the students and the kids and the, the elderly people who can't drive a car or don't have a car anymore, it's almost everybody having a car. And if you count it up, 17 million people living here, you have around 9 million cars. This is too much. This is way too much. But why that? The thing is that the government goes a completely different other way than the cities. The cities really want to get rid of the car and want to make the cities more livable. But the government sees that the Dutch people spend on average 44 hours a year in a traffic jam. This is the second place after Belgium. So almost two days in the year, every Dutch person stays in a traffic jam. And what they do is they are facilitating, facilitating again, building bigger streets. But what we know from the past is, if you build streets, the, like, the more streets you build, the more cars you have. It's always the case. In the 60s, we built two-lane highways, like with two lanes. They were too small traffic jams. In the 70s, three lanes, five lanes. The widening from the A2 to Utrecht to Amsterdam to 10 lanes, five lanes in each direction. And what will you have in 10 years? Traffic jams? Probably. The wide, the, what will come up is the widening of the A27 in Utrecht right to Amelis with to, to 16 lanes. This is eight lanes on each side. This is almost like in the States. Or, which, is, which was just announced, the widening of the A27 between Breda and Utrecht will start in 2019. And just imagine, only this project costs 2.5 billion euros. This is really expensive, and the more streets you build, the more you have to maintain, of course. And also what they do is they build giant parking facilities outside of the city. So, for example, a new park and ride here at the Oithof. This is the city wants to get rid of the cars, but there are still so many cars because in the out, the people, were living, people living outside of the cities, they use their car. So they build those parking facilities and try to let people park there and go with public transport into the city. This is only the solution for half of the problem because you will have the problem outside. You will have all these demographic problems with um, the infrastructure, like daily life infrastructure. And maybe in the future when energy gets more expensive, we can't move as cheap anymore as we can do now. And this is the typical statement that the politicians give, why they do that. Because it's good for the economy. If we have less, uh, less uh, traffic jams, then it will, it will also increase the accessibility of the region. This is the typical statement, but this is so wrong. The more you build, the more traffic jams you will have. Um, yeah, and actually now, I don't know if I'm still good in time, it's still okay. So I would like actually to have a look with you at Utrecht. Um, because mm -hmm. everything what I told now, you can see in Utrecht. You can see it like really obviously. So maybe Robert, you can just switch there. I'm trying to go back to Utrecht, but now I'm in her token bush. <laughs> 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 Wait, Utrecht don't play. <coughs> okay. So just go, yeah, just scroll that in. And move a little bit, yeah, perfect. So that's the city center of Utrecht. And you can see everything in Utrecht from the development of the last like 2,000 years. So it started all here, right? This, is, this was the Roman, the Roman soldier base. It was, a, it was a square. Romans were, like, they tend to build squares, like a chess, like this, this like, you know, like in the United States, the structure. So this was where it all started. This is the square. And this is also where you have now these little lines in the ground where the steam comes up. And then in the, in the, in the Middle Ages, the city was growing. Like, as, as I mentioned, there were already bigger cities. They were mainly built where there were rivers. And so this is the medieval city around it here. And it was staying like this, like it was growing, of course, but it was staying like this until the 18th century, maybe. And as you can see, this is, the, everything is really close here. I mean, you know, you know it, you live there. So you have everything in walking distance, and it's really nice to live in this part of the city. Um, if you zoom out a little bit, Robert. So, these, these were the areas, Wilhelmina Park, Nobelstraat, all these areas, they were built in the uh, 19th century when this first boom came, when all the people moved into the city. So you have this beautiful old house where also most of you live. 
um, which is still nice. You have still, you have, you have, um, you have still a mix of functions. You had everything. You had little shops. You had people who were not working far from their home. You have narrow streets. Everything is very nice in those parts. But then, this city, as all, almost all other cities in the world, they like this boom of the cars. They changed the view of the city. So these districts, they were built after that, when the car came. And actually what they did here, so we have here the single, the Katarine single, they filled it with concrete so that cars have more space. Actually the plan was to fill all the Krachten and Utrecht with concrete so that you have streets and cars can go on there. Luckily they didn't do it. And now you think, why is it, why, I mean, in, in Utrecht driving like a car is a pain in the ass. Of course it is. Because the city was built in the, in the Middle Ages and the city was not built for the cars. It's, it's just not built for that, so it's not good to drive a car here. But just, the, can you zoom in a little bit more? Like, yeah, perfect. And now go a little bit like this, like in this direction, yeah, perfect. You see this, do you see which space here is used for cars? Everything here. Everything what you see here is cars. Everywhere, everywhere here. Everything here, Canal Island, Oberfecht. This is all, all like 60s, 70s. This all was only built for the cars. It was not built for the people. This is, this is not livable. I mean, you can, you can live there in your flat, but you don't go outside, it's not nice. You go maybe into the city center, it's, mu it's much nicer. And um, if you go now over the, over the river and you go to Leitzerang, which is the new, yeah, a little bit, little bit up. Mm -hmm. Perfect, yeah, a little bit up. So Leitzerang is built here, a new district for more than 100,000 people. And now you could think, what, what can people actually do now to, to make it better? I mean, they could, but they don't, like planners. So first what they did is they built a big tunnel for the, for the A2, a 10 lanes highway, for 1 billion euro, a tunnel only to prevent people living there from the noise. Nobody wants to live close to that highway, so they built a big tunnel, 1.6 kilometers for 1 billion euros. And then if you go a little bit like this, so what you can see here, this is not much different to the picture that I showed you from, from earlier. This is just living, this is just houses, space for the cars in front of every house, every, everywhere here. There's no mix, there, there's just people living in their flats, but nobody, there's no life on the streets. I mean, it's also not dangerous on the streets there, because, I mean, <laughs> nothing happening there. But it's also not nice to live there, so actually it would be nice to see if the city would supporting also people moving into the new houses and maybe don't have space anymore for their car, because they don't use it there, of course. Um, and maybe you could go back to the presentation. So this is urban sprawl, Dutch. Uh, this is Dutch urban sprawl, yeah. And actually what you can see in the Randstad, this is very interesting. I mean, the Randstad actually grew together as one metropolitan area. If you go from Utrecht to Amsterdam, you have, like, it's, it's, it's almost one residential area in between. You have hardly any space in between. It all grew together. And now you have long ways. So, okay. So what, what, what can we do? What should planners do? Um, the main thing is they, they should go from urban planning to urban design because if you do design something, you design it for the customer. Everything which you have is designed for you. You buy it because it's useful and it's, it's designed for you. Cities were not designed anymore for us. You can see it here. This is a typical thing. You have, you have a bridge over a street and here cars can go 70 kilometers an hour. And pedestrians and cyclists, in order to cross the street, they had to go all the way up here, up the bridge and go down again. This is so annoying. Nobody does that. Of course nobody does that. You can see it here. This is a desire line. This is where people want to go. They want to cross really short. And of course it's dangerous because cars are really, really fast. But just build this and maintain this. This is really expensive. It's stupid. So this is the main thing. Everywhere in the city, everywhere where people live, 30K. Nothing more. Because then immediately you would have people feeling much more safe. Cyclists on the streets, it's no problem anymore to build in expensive new infrastructure because nobody wants to do it anymore, there's no money for that. So 30k everywhere where people live. This is a picture from, uh, from a street in Copenhagen in the, in, the, in the 70s. Typical picture in the city in center, only cars. This is what they made out of that. I took this picture and I mean you know that the people from Europe, we have pedestrian areas everywhere, but they're enlarging the pedestrian zones. They, they widen it to a whole network. This is nice. This is, the livable space. And this is also important. Planners should consider this. If you have a 3 meter, 3.5 meter width of a street, like a normal street, then you could process uh, in an hour 2,300 cars through it. So around 3,000 people if you keep the average um, occupancy in a car in mind. Uh, 10,000 people by bus, 13,000 by bike, 17,000 by, by, by walking. 
And with a tram, 25,000 people an hour. So this is the most efficient means of transport in a city, of course. And on larger distances, it's the train. And if you have short distances, it's the bicycle. So people should actually, the planners should look, what do the people want? What do they need? What's this? This is, a, this is from a traffic light. And this here is, again, a desire light. This is, maybe you can't see it now, but you can see it there. This is where people hold mm. their hands, always, because they have a bike and they don't want to step down. So why not building a footrest where people can put their feet and hold their hands? Or why not building a bin which is directed to the cyclists so that they can throw their waist in it while they're riding the bike? Or why not taking car lanes off? This was a four-lane street before, and then two lanes were removed, and the, others, the other street parts were just short, like narrowed. So pe those cars have to be really slow, and people use the space. This is a little space anymore, and it's safe because cars are going really, really slow. So that's actually where I want to end my talk, and this is... I want to end my talk with this poster that the company where I did my internship did. Typical poster from Copenhagen Ice. This is the planning guide for livable cities. As you can see, make cycling, bus, intermodality the fastest way, and cars, yeah, you know. Yeah. Thanks.